It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Melissa Turner, B-A-S-D-H-E-D-P-H. That's a Bachelor's Applied Sciences Dental Hygiene, and the EDPH is Expanded Practice Dental Hygienist, who currently holds various roles within the dental industry as an influencer, thought leader, advisor, and consultant. With a unique experience of practicing dentistry across the country, she's an expert in mobile dentistry as both a for-profit and non-profit delivery model. In addition to running a nonprofit mobile program in Minnesota, she is founder of iHeart Mobile Dentistry Facebook community and is launching the first ever National Mobile Dentistry Conference in the spring of 2020. Melissa's current goal is to reframe the traditional views of hot topic issues such as teledentistry, direct access, independent hygiene practice, dental therapy, as well as the rise of the millennial workforce. She's an executive moderator for the Dental Peeps Network and works internally with companies such as OnDM, Floss Bar, and Mouthwash. Uh, Mouthwatch. Her latest advocacy efforts include launching a nationwide hashtag campaign, uh, Love in the Workplace, to bring back love as an action into dental practices everywhere. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My, thank you for having me. Man, it is an honor to have you on the show. And just reading your intro, I mean, everything in your intro is a hot topic, controversial, no holds bar issue. I mean, there is nothing, uh, there is nothing boring about your resume. Um, so let, let's start with the first one. Your the initials after your name. Every, most dentists understand RDH is for registered dental hygienist, um, but you have a bachelor's of applied sciences in dental hygiene. So that that's a um, a more extended, most hygienists get that if they want to teach hygiene, right? Correct. Yep. But the or if you want to join the sales force too. But the mm-hmm. second one um, is your EDPH expanded practice dental hygienist, so you can do hygiene without the dentist in the room. That's correct. That's and correct. and so That's- I got a. Uh, I'm old enough to be your uh, hopefully just your dad and not your granddad. Uh, but it's kind of funny because when you go back through dental history. Um, when dentists were just pulling teeth and doing dentures, there was this early pioneer called Bob uh, Barkley. Have you ever heard of him, Bob Barkley? He's about 100 years ago, and I paid way too many thousands of dollars uh, for his book. And uh, um, um, at a, um, But anyway, um, Bob Barkley was going around the country trying to tell dentists that they need to hire this new degree professional, this registered dental hygienist, to do preventive. And the entire pushback was, dude, I'm so busy pulling teeth and doing dentures. I don't have time for this. And then the same issues today. um, um, She's a threat to my dental sovereignty and all those same issues back when everybody was losing their teeth and getting dentures. And Mm -hmm. now here it is. Now my four kids have turned into five grandkids. I'm 56. And when a hygienist wants to practice by yourself, the dentists act like she's some communist alien coming in, uh, you know, ready to destroy dentistry. Why, yeah. why, why is it like that? Well, you know, for one thing, I think dentists are often stressed out and, and stressed <laughs> out to run the business. <laughs> I mean, you name it, to run the business, to manage, to not only do those things, but then, you know, be the primary profit in, in the clinical side of things. So I would imagine, I'm not a dentist, but I would imagine that dentists are so focused on what they can do that anything outside of that might be a little bit scary, might be a little bit, well, I don't have time for that right now. And so things like, you know, independent dental hygiene practices or direct access to dental hygienists are are kind of scary for them until they have the bandwidth to actually, you know, really absorb it and to see how it can be a, a profitable enterprise if, if they you know, embark on that. So expanded practice, that's a permit specifically for Oregon. Um, I just moved from Minnesota and in Minnesota, I was a collaborative practice dental hygienist. And there we, we had to have a written agreement with a dentist. Um, and if I did, if I had that, then I could practice without an onsite presence of a dentist um, and provide care in various, that, that was mostly nonprofit um, settings. So, so I list all those arguments of why they were against Bob Barkley telling him to hire hygienists because he was literally looking at him saying, do you want your children to grow up and have a denture or would you like them to have their teeth? I mean, they, they just didn't even get it. Same arguments they, I say to a dentist, so your kids 
um, moves away from home. He lives in some small town. It's only got a thousand people. There's no dentist there. And some hygienist wants to open up her own dental office right there in her own home in a town of 1,000. And tell me why that's a bad idea for your own child and your grandchild. And there's like, uh, and then I say, so, so was, was Bob Barkley wrong? Should we get rid of all the hygienists and do our own cleanings? They go, no. So, so it's the same thing with expanded duty function assistance. You go to yeah. Kansas and the dentist will num load three rooms. He'll num, 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 drill, drill, drill. And then the expanded duties go in there and place the matrix and place the restoration yeah. and they love it. And now I'm in Arizona and I tell one of my Arizona dentists there that, and they're like, are you smoking that new medical marijuana? I mean, how how can you think something that crazy? So I, I just really don't get it. And then when I go to those small towns, most of them are in Colorado, and I find an independent practicing hygienist. There's no dentist in that town. And then the dentist five miles up the road on the highway just loves that person because they're referring them things of the uh, that concern them. And, 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 and they're sending them cookies and cakes and candies trying to get their business. So, so and let's to me, it's a brainer. It really is. It opens up a dentist's chair for more lucrative procedures. They don't have to have, you know, how's the in-office hygiene. So yes, thank you for being able to relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, when I have this conversation with dentists and I have so many times, I always say that at some point, you know, we're all going to be lose autonomy and be in an assisted living facility or, you know, be in a skilled nursing facility and nobody's going to look in our mouth for weeks at a time, no basic home care. And it's then that we're going to realize, man, I wish I would have, you know, advocated for hygienists to have a little, you know, increased, uh, decreased supervision so that she can come in here and brush my teeth and, and make me feel better. You know? So I, I've gone, I've spent a whole shift in a dozen different nursing homes from Wichita, Kansas to Phoenix, Arizona. And, and, um, first of all, I'm, I don't have to worry about nursing homes because when you go into a nursing home, they're all women and there's no men. Uh, when, uh we, um, I asked, uh, my orthopedic surgeon one time way back in the day, I was reading something that the majority of all, almost all hip replacements are on women. And I said to my orthopedic surgeon and, um, uh, Dr. Jonathan Fox, I said, why is that? Are men just got stronger hips? And he goes, no, it's just very hard to break your hip while you're in the grave. And uh, he said, you die right about the prime time to start breaking hips. So nursing homes and broken hips is more of a woman thing. But when you go in those nursing homes, four and a half percent of Americans will finish out their life in a nursing home. And the dental care is an atrocity. They get, they average one new root surface cavity every month. So as soon as grandma's been in there a year, she's got 12 cavities. And mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to change that with mobile dentistry. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. That's right. And that's, you know, kind of direct access to dental hygiene and mobile dentistry and teledentistry. They kind of all go hand in hand in the same kind of like, let's get better access to dental care and not just for underserved individuals, not just for the indigent populations, for the middle class folks, for all of us that are going to end up in the 4% in, in nursing homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, now that we got, uh, I, as far as availability and accessibility, I think the main issue in Arizona was, you know, can they deliver alcohol to your door? And now that we got that locked up, now it's time uh, to move on to like cleanings and, and dentistry and all that kind of stuff. And then a lot of these dentists say, well, I don't want to do that because it's it's all Medicaid. But they don't realize that you go in there and you treat 12 root surface cavities with silver diamine fluoride and you're only in a room for 10 minutes. I don't care what, what they're paying you. I don't care if it's 10, 20, 30 dollars of filling. You just did 12 of them in 10 minutes. Um, is silver diamine fluoride, is that is that part of a nursing home mobile dentistry in your mind? Oh um, yeah, nursing homes, uh, school mobile dentistry. That's probably one of the the newest, most important things that we can give, at least to the to the public health arena, um, to those folks. Yeah. So um, you have a couple different websites. Let's just start with um, um, your operation, Grace MN Minnesota dot org. Um, mm -hmm. What what is um, what, what's going on there? So Operation Grace is a nonprofit charitable organization um, that I help run, and it's based in Minnesota. We provide um, preventive and restorative care free of charge to underserved individuals, mostly in high schools, um, and then you know some homeless residences and things like that. So we work closely with dental therapists. We have a volunteer aspect of our program. 
Um, we use things like teledentistry, um, silver diamine fluoride. Um, and, you know, our focus lately has really been to take a team of hygienists to each school two or three times a year and really give continuity of care. And we stay there for a week and, and we have about two hour appointments each time. And we, we do as many sealants as we can. And we do as many applications of, of SDF as we can. And really, you know, just in case we never see the patient again, we, we put it all on them as much as they can handle. Um, and we're seeing some great results with that. Um, we just started about a, a year ago in, in that program model. And it's, it's been very rewarding so far. Mm-hmm. I think that's very cool because uh, usually America can be summed up in money's the answer. What's the question? And then throughout your life journey, you find people who really just care about things. Yeah. Even there's money, but I, I the website's amazing, and 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 young people listen to the show. Uh, it's a it's a millennial thing. Old people don't listen to podcasts. But on, on your website, forty seven percent of dentists are fifty five years or older and practicing in rural regions of. Uh, the state where dentists are least likely to practice. So you just graduated last week. You got three hundred thousand dollars in student loans, and where are you going to go set up? Downtown Scottsdale, where all the rich people live, and no, and they they won't need a dentist in Scottsdale for twenty years. Um, so when you look at these accessibility issues and uh, find a dentist Minnesota and Operation Grace Minnesota, is this more of a rural problem than an urban problem? I mean, is it? Is, I- I don't think so. I think it's all across the board. You know, a lot of um, in Minnesota, a lot of what Operation Grace does is mostly based around Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, because that's where most of the population is. So it, it just depends on on what your target audience is. Um, I think it's I don't think it's rural versus urban. I think it's just everywhere and all the time. And and then it, it crosses the money, the you know, the Medicare line too. And it's middle class folks, it's even even some wealthy folks that don't understand dentistry and have a hard time accessing it too. So you said something um, right out of the gate. You said it's really three things. It's teledentistry, um, expanded practice, hygienist, and mobile dentistry. You think that's the, uh, is that is this the perfect storm you're talking about? I, I think so. And I think it's, you know, the basic underlying issue is to use all, if you're going to embark on mobile dentistry, you want to use all your licensed clinicians um, at the top of their license. And that includes the dentist. Um, and, and that's a big key that we don't talk about a lot. You know, we're used to hygienists saying, hey, use me at the top of my license. But for dentists to realize they're not being used at the top of their license, that, that kind of puts things in perspective a little bit, too. So I, I think those are the really the three keys to access and to mobile mobile services. And, and you um, you are very um, experienced in for profit and non for profit. And what what is your uh, um if someone from Mars asks you, well, what's the difference between for-profit dentistry and non-profit dentistry? What, what would you tell them? Well, I think it's it's all about who you serve. So the for-profit um, dentistry would be like your typical dental office that isn't targeting underserved populations or Medicare patients. It would be the ones that are just targeting, you know, those who have insurance and those who can afford it. Um, so I, I usually divide it down between nonprofit and for profit, but there's various other ways you can you can divide it as well. Do they both seem to be as efficient? Um, yes, I mean the there are a few pioneers like Floss Bar, for instance, is is a company that's taking um, um, services into uh, business places and treating employees. Um, and the way they do it is very efficient, but, but the, the key is with mobile dentistry, there's so many ways you can adapt it. So I think that's the the main efficiency with mobile dentistry. You can make it what you want and you can only choose to provide preventive services. You can only, you can do the full, full shebang if you want. Um, and you can only have one provider doing it or you can have a million, you know, it's, it's up to you. Um, so it's so adaptable and that's where the efficiency comes in into play for both nonprofit and for-profit. Well, that's, um, so you just mentioned Floss Bar and the founder and CEO is Eva Sadage. Sadage? Mm -hmm. She was, Mm -hmm. um, she was on the podcast, uh, 900, and I'll okay. tell you what, when I posted that on Dental Town, oh my gosh, that threat, it has 620 replies with 18,000 views because what, what does she represent? A threat 
to all the old guys. And here's this young, <laughs> this young yeah. whippersnapper with this new idea. And all the old guys were just lemmings ready to run off a, a bridge. Why do you think um, the townies, um, why, why, do you, why do you think all the townies in their 50s and 60s um, were so shocked by the floss bar? What, what, what well, is it? It really is a new way of thinking. And it's even the language they use to market is based on a millennial audience. It's not based on the 50s and the 60s um, target audience. And so when something is foreign to somebody, they're they're gonna start to get a little defensive. And so for me, you know, I looked at that and I've gone to dry bars, which is what Floss Bar's title is a play off of. Um, so you go to a big city, you go to a dry bar and you get your hair blow, blow okay, dry. I, right? I don't have any hair. I, I miss that whole thing. The, the, floss, the floss Bar is a play on what? Dry, the dry bar. So go to New York City and you just want to have your hair styled. Um, you go into the, a dry bar and they blow dry it and they make it look really nice because blow drying is actually very difficult to do it the right way. And so floss bar <laughs> is a play. It is. So floss bar is a play on, on that word. So just the name itself is geared towards a total specific, you know, niche and um, generation. Um, so, you know, that in itself, you know, uh, somebody who's 60 year old might look at floss bar and think, okay, alcohol and flossing, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there. But for me, that, that wasn't my filter. Um, I understood right away. So just something as easy as that can make or break a difference. And you, um, you, you're having a, um, a big meeting on this coming up and I've been to so many dental meetings and a lot of them have been really nice places and resorts and you go down there and they to pamper you and all they have is, well, do you want your hair done? No. Uh, do you uh, want a mani-pedi? Not really. And I would always say, you know, can I get my teeth clean? And they look at me like I was from Mars and I look at all these resorts and, and a lot of times, you know, all these dentists are coming in from everywhere and so many dentists have said to me, hey, my wife's uh, at the hotel and she want to know, uh, do you think there's any place she could get a cleaning while she's here at this three day convention in Scottsdale? I say no, That's but, great, you know, yeah. they've, they've legalized weed. But, you know, having a hygienist drive to your hotel in a mobile dentistry. Um, but I, I availability and access is just huge. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I love these different um, um, business models. Um, how is the floss bar doing? Really good. Um, we just expanded nationwide within you know the last year. Um, so things are picking up and and we're just coming up with great marketing strategies to push out soon and just stay tuned. it's 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 a really good thing. and it's kind of, you know we we want it to to we want the dentist, the practice owner to look at it as, Floss Bar will come in and be an extension of your practice for you. We will be the mobile delivery for you. You just kind of rent the day or rent the chair and um, we will, you know, do everything else for you. And then you get the referrals. So it's a great funneling way to funnel all the, all the, your local patients who you want in your practice back, back to the practice itself. Huh. Um, so um, you also um, there, there's a lot. There's so many companies that you're uh, familiar with. Another one is um, the Dental Peeps Network. Um, mm -hmm. So for my uh, the people listening, out, what what is the Dental Peeps Network? Is that David Black, um, the associate coach and consultant? Is he? Is he, he the? Is, is he the founder? The founder of the Dental founder is Lee Duke and Ricky Shaffron. Oh, Lee Duke, and mm -hmm. who else? Ricky Shaffron, S H A F F R E N. So, so tell them what um, what that is. So, the Dental Peeps Network is um, the largest social media network of dental professionals nationwide. Um, basically, we have about two hundred and seventy-five thousand members. It's spread out through um, probably about two hundred local. Um, groups. So there's a Minneapolis Dental Peeps, a Philadelphia Dental Peeps, and through these groups, all dental professionals, no matter if you're, you know, an office manager or a dentist, you're you're able to network locally. Um, and so it's it's a really valuable tool. And there hasn't been something like it prior, where where we're, you're divided into locales, basically. Um, so it's it's been a really great thing. We've we've had a lot of um, local get-togethers in certain cities where people just go out and have some drinks for the day. Um, we have CE study clubs going on. 
Um, and lots of exciting, lots of exciting things down the road. And what is their, I mean, what do they do? What is their, what is their mission? The Dental Peeps Network? Yeah. The tagline, tagline is um, global, global, global network, local community, something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm missing it now. So it's, it's, it's a way, it's, it's a way to connect and it's a way to, um, you know, down the road, we might have some conventions or different other types of events um, in different ways, member benefits, basically. Yeah. Um, and then you're also with um, uh, On DM. That's what, Joe yeah. Fogg on On DM? Yes. Yes. So, so tell them about Joe Fogg and On DM and what, what's all that about? So On DM is the latest in staffing apps. We, I like to think of it as Uber meets LinkedIn for, for dentistry. Um, basically real-time staffing. So uh, a practice can sign up and make a practice profile and list temporary or permanent jobs. They can use it for working interviews or maternity coverage. Um, and then individual clinicians will also make profiles. And it's basically you upload your resume and you make yourself look good. And um, you set your availability if you want to temp or you set your availability if you want to have a permanent position. And then real time, you know, as the, as the, the jobs become available, you will get um, alerted to the jobs. And then you can also reach out to the practice and, um, and communicate with the practice on the actual app itself. So you you said um, on DM is where Uber meets dentistry. Uber meets LinkedIn. Oh, Uber dentistry. meets LinkedIn. Yeah. And and explain explain that a little more. Why, why well, is it where uh, uh, on DM is where Uber meets LinkedIn? What what do you mean by that? Well, so you know these days we have the Uberization of everything. We want everything in real time. We want everything cloud based in your hand, and and so that's what this staffing app this on dm does but then the linkedin part of it is is we really wanted um a way to kind of vet professionals and and upload a resume and show you know make yourself look good and, and make yourself shine so that's where the linkedin aspect of it comes in um and and you can do some kind some a little networking on it too if you want to reach out to a practice or if they want to reach out to a to a professional and that's kind of what um we're calling the, the gig economy yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. the, the gig economy. Now, is this more uh, for uh, dentists, hygienists, uh, assistant? Who 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 is um, using on DM the most? Which one of the? It's, it's, right now, it is everyone. And you know what? Uh, it ebbs and flows. We just had graduates. A whole bunch of graduates use it. Um, it ebbs and flows based on the locale, based on the demand. You know, for about two years now, I've seen a huge shortage of um, dental assistants. Um, and I thought it was just in my area of the country. And since working with on DM, I realized it is everywhere. And so it just really does ebb and flow. And, and it's it's a pretty good amount of, of each each role in dentistry right now. Well, I mean, this is um, very, very low unemployment. I mean, I, I have so many people tell me right here in Phoenix. I mean, there's four million people in the metro. And uh, every dentist I saw this weekend said, I, I've been looking for a dental assistant for six weeks. I, I haven't even... No one's even dropped off a resume. And I'm like, well, that we're we're very, very low unemployment. Um, so yeah. we're when when I mean when you're down to three percent unemployment, three out of a hundred people shouldn't have a job. And and mm -hmm. and when you meet that three out of a hundred people that's unemployed, most of them are unemployable. I mean, um, and yeah. it's really weird because five percent unemployment, everybody thinks is the healthiest recircling one out of twenty people from one job to another job is the smoothest deal. And when that just gets to 10% unemployment, um, the, the, then the, the sheep get restless and who's ever in the White House is unemployed and Congress flips over. So 5% is optimum, 10% is chaos in the street, and 3%, you can't find a dental assistant. That makes sense. And you know, that's what we see with on DM. You know, even if we are in that 3%, a practice can go and they can vet, they can look at the, the professional's profile and vet um, whether or not they even want to reach out to this professional. And that's one of the key benefits to using it. Um, you know, a, a person who uploads their resume, who writes three sentences about themselves, the way they write it, the spelling, the grammar, you know, 
that tells a lot about a person. Um, so this is, it's just a good way to kind of vet professionals before you even spend time interviewing them. I, uh, I don't even want to say this because we're being recorded online, but like my, my team, uh, when you drop off a resume, they're not even going to look at it. They're going to see if really? you got enough hustle. If you're going to follow up, call, email, come by. And my God, yeah. if you drop off a resume and then you pop in the next day and ask if you have any questions about it, my team's already drooling. Indeed. They're all drooling <laughs> like, oh my God, I want this person. They're hustling because that's such a huge part of success is just to get up every morning and work hard and hustle. And if you mm -hmm. don't want to get up and you don't want to work hard and you don't want to hustle, I, you know, life's going to be tough. I'm um, speaking about life as being tough. We just had, you know, 6,000 uh, dental uh, school graduates come out uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, you've been in this um, in this space for a long time at a very high level, seeing all these things. What advice would you give the graduating class? They're all 24 I, with $300,000 of debt. What would you tell this gang? <laughs> I would say, you know what? Do whatever works for you for the first five years. Experiment, work in different practices, work, you know, don't settle on one thing within the first five years because you don't know where the economy is going. You know, so many dentists come out and buy practices right away because that's what they think is going to be successful. But now there's options working with DSOs, you know, even just volunteering. You know, I'm all about volunteering because of course I run a volunteer program, but volunteering will open your eyes to, to the other avenues that, that are out there. Um, and networking is key, you know, in, in my generation and below, most of what we do is online. So any type of in-person networking, is so much more powerful and and so much more effective. And you know, if I have had, if I would have one piece of advice, that would be it. You know, to anyone that's graduating, go and get out there, network your butt off. Yeah, you're you're always running for mayor. It's not what you know; it's what you know and who you know. And the problem with dentists is that the the natural selection is we're not going to let you in the club unless in undergrad you were that boring idiot who got a's in calculus and physics and in biology and i mean you know my my the four guys that i lived with at creighton uh, all got accepted dental school we were the biggest nerds we just lived in the library <laughs> and then when they get out now the skill is not physics and chemistry and no one cares how long ago the big bang is and they don't care about the expansion of space and time and you, if you can't talk to your patients and talk to your staff and you just got to get out and network it, but they live in fear. Like, like, like yep. they'll say um, to me here in Phoenix, where I live, they'll say, well, what implant course do you recommend? And then I'll say, well, what are you thinking about? And they'll list three implant um, courses that are all a thousand miles away. And I'm like, <laughs> well, why don't you walk across the street to the periodontist? Have, have you, when's the last time you had lunch with the periodontist? And they say, never. Never, you've never met the periodontist and he's a hundred yards from your office. No. Well, why don't you go take him to lunch? He could probably teach you for free. And then when you had a problem, you got a buddy that, and you know, and so it's just ne right. networking is just everything. Um, so, so mobile dentistry, um, five, 10 years from now, is, is it going to be a real thing? I mean, is it going to be, cause, cause I don't believe it's a real thing. Like, like right now, um, you know, like wind and solar. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's they nuclear is 20% of your energy. They could have scaled nuclear from 20% to 100% in four years. Mm -hmm. And during that same 20 years, they keep talking about wind and solar. And I'm like, man, you could have, at this point, you could have ran the whole planet on nuclear. Um, mm -hmm. So the mobile dentistry, is it bleeding edge? Is it a theory? Or do you think how long will it take before it hits a tipping point? Like say, 5% of all dentistry done mobile. I think within 10 years, we'll have that. And then I think at 10 years, it'll be so commonplace that we won't even call it mobile dentistry anymore. We'll just call it whatever it is, just a part of how we practice. I think it's, I've, I've really, I, you know, I've really seen an increase in people who are interested and there's only going to be, you know, a small niche of people, a small percentage of people that really are interested in pursuing it. But those that are interested are going to really grab on in the next five years, I think, and then put it into practice, you know, soon after that. So um, do you recommend a mobile dental? I mean, say some kids listen to you right now and he says, I, I want to buy a big old RV and just drive <laughs> around doing dentistry. Who who would sell that mobile dentistry, that, that device? 
Who, who would know, you recommend? There's a couple of ways you can go about it. There's a couple of different companies. And then you can also, you know, kind of get a literal RV camper and, and refurbish it as well. Um, it's, it's one of those things I, I think we'll be seeing more companies, um, you know, launch and, and target that kind of product, you know, in the next couple of years. Yeah. So, so what is the target market for mobile dentistry? Is that mostly nursing homes and uh, elementary schools? Yeah, right now I would think it, it's mostly underserved people. And then the two settings would be nursing homes and, and elementary schools. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things um, why Operation Grace serves high schools is because every there are so many mobile programs for elementary schools because all the sealant programs and they want to you know teach kids when they're young. But then by the time they get to high school, they're almost underserved and, you know, in themselves because nobody is paying attention to them anymore. So the fact that Operation Grace can provide restorative services and extractions, you know, by the time you get to high school, you, you need those you need those services there as well. And, and um, so we've been talking about mobile dentistry. We've been talking about, you know, um, expanded duty um, dental hygienists. Um, I mean, competition is what every industry now. So when I was little. And I was 10 years old and I was walking down 364 North through 10 in Wichita, Kansas. Every third or fourth garage, um, the dad, the brother, and the uncle were spending the whole day fixing this crappy American car. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you spent at least one Saturday a month trying to get your old beater running. And then they finally, uh, Japan and Germany started selling cars that actually worked. And yeah. that was the first time GM, Chrysler, and Ford thought, damn, we're actually going to have to make a good product. And if you took away all the international car makers, Chrysler, you know, it would it would, it would be horrible. So everybody knows competition is good for every industry except their own industry. Uh, they right. want, uh, yeah, they just want it everywhere but in dentistry. But right. the best thing that could happen to dentistry, especially the patients, which is the only reason we went to dental school, um, would be more competition. And so we talked about mobile, um, but what is really teledentistry? Is that just a, an expanded duty in a mobile? Is that like uh, forward projection and the displacement of dental services from a dental offices? Or is it more technology related like, uh, you know, intro cameras and digital x-rays sending information back to some home base. When I say teledentistry, what, what does that mean to you? So teledentistry to me is basically the technology that allows, you know, allows a flat world, basically. It allows dentistry to be in multiple locations and communicate at one time. So the cloud, cloud-based technology is, is a huge part of teledentistry. Um, and then, you know, you asked about rural patients who, who need services. I mean, this is where teledentistry comes into play. You have one hub, you have one office, and lots of spokes who are using teledentistry, lots of people going out to those locations, uh, uh, an associate or a hygienist going to a rural location and using teledentistry to communicate with the main provider. Um, it's fascinating. And so to me, it's, it's mostly a tech technology um, platform. And how did you link the um, hashtag love in the workplace or I heart mobile dentistry um, with, with the mobile dentistry? What's the link between hashtag love in the workplace or I Heart Mobile Dentistry. Um, tell, tell us about that. What's that about? I mean, obviously well, you're a very gifted marketer. I'm, I'm serious. I have a flair for marketing and you have a better one than I do. Uh, okay. Yeah. So really what, what my goal is, what the backbone of, of all of these things, whether it's the love in the work, work, workplace hashtag campaign, whether it's reframing what independent dental hygienist means or is or teledentistry, the backbone of all of that is to help kind of nudge, to put it politely, nudge the dental industry into, um, you know, getting with the times. It's almost like dentistry is so siloed. You know, we we know this. We're, we're so old school. It's kind of like we're trying to do analog things in a digital world. Some dental offices are really still doing analog in a digital world, but we're not with the times yet. And I think it's hurting the dental profession. Um, as a whole. And so for me, all of these little projects and, and um, initiatives that I'm involved with, it's, it's a way to kind of help nudge dentistry into getting with the times. Um, 
And it's, it's super important too. And I think, I think now is the time to do that because simply because, and it's so cliche to say, we blame everything on the millennials, but because the millennials are now, you know, becoming the top of the workforce and the leaders and the business owners, and they're also becoming the consumers, you know, it's, it's, it's time for these things to shift, but for the tide to shift a little bit. So when you say a licensed professional working at the top of their dental license, does that mean when they just got their dental license or when they're old and fat and bald and at the end of their license? What, 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 do, you, what do you mean by at working at the top of their license? Well, to me, that means doing all the procedures, basically the most, all of your procedures, your entire scope and the most difficult procedures. So you can have a dentist sitting down and, and you know completing MLL fillings every day, or you can have a dentist who is focusing on whole mouth restoration and implants and veneers. And you know which dentist do you wanna be? If, if you're working at the top of your license, in my mind, that means you're, you're doing those full mouth restorations and you're, you're really focusing on, on the things that you can specialize in and you're delegating all the, all the other things out. So you're delegating the, the simple fillings out to, you know, your expanded functions, dental assistant, you're delegating, you know, all of your cleanings out to where they're supposed to go to the hygienist and things like that. Dental therapist is completely different than what, what, what do you, what do you call the hygienist for the expanded duty? I guess the degree, um, you call them collaborative practice, dental hygienist, uh, do you call them uh, just BA um, or EDPH expanded practice dental hygienist? Or you were saying that was just an Oregon thing? Uh, uh, well, so so in the past, we were called the the uh, the umbrella term was called independent dental hygienist, and we have now switched to to a more definitive term, direct access dental hygienist. Um, so each state, probably about 40, 42 out of the out of all the states, called it something different. So each state will have a form or a different variety of a direct access. Um, well, what's the term for now? Direct access. Access dental hygienist. Direct access dental hygienist. Mm -hmm, or dental hygiene services. Yeah. Dental hygiene. Uh, services. Huh, that is interesting. And it used to be called independent dental hygienist or mm -hmm. collaborative practice dental hygienist. Or collaborative practice is what Minnesota currently calls it. Expanded practice dental hygienist is what um, Oregon calls it. Um, you know, Arizona or no, not Arizona, Colorado has actually has independent dental hygienist. Like, you know, you can own their own practice. Same with Maine. Um, so each state will call it something different. Sometimes they're called public health dental hygienists. So what do you think, um, what, what do you think is scaring the herd of dentists right now more? Is it dental therapists or is it independent dental hygienists? Um, I mean, oh, it's a dental therapist. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talk yeah. about that. So what, what is a dental therapist and how is it different than a dental hygienist? So there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of myths out there about what a dental therapist actually is. And, um, the American Dental Hygienist Association has been, has been ad advocating for dental or de for dental therapists for probably 10, 15 years now. Um, but it's, it's important to note that probably only about two or 3% of dental hygienists want to become a dental therapist because it's an, it's an entirely different scope of practice. It's basically 50 different, you know, services that a dentist could provide. Um, and a dental therapist is not a dental hygienist. So there's there's a couple different myths that I usually have to debunk before we can even start a conversation on dental therapy. Um, so dental therapists in Minnesota, you know, I have friends who are dental therapists. I've worked with, with them a lot. Um, they have to be dual licensed as a dental hygienist. So it's a completely different role and scope and and way of, of doing things. So a dental hygienist legally in Minnesota can't be a dental therapist or vice versa. You can if you have two different licenses. You have to have both yeah. licenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. We need. We just need more licenses. That's that's usually the answer. Uh, but um. So um. So what's the status on dental therapists? So um, how does it look like now? Is it is it flatline? Is it growing? Is it exponentially growing? What, what what's the state of it now look like to you? 
Well, well, so in Minnesota, um, but prior to this year, there were 89 dental therapists that were practicing. And some of those were advanced dental therapists and some of those were dental therapists regular dental therapists. So we're just getting to the point where we can really start to get some data and some information on how effective dental therapy has been going. So if you, if you look at Minnesota in specific, um, you know, the practice owners that have hired dental therapists would say it's phenomenal. You know, they are freed. They don't have to, they, they can work at the top of their license. If, if we go back to our um, previous conversation, they're freed to give the dental therapist the simple extractions um, the, the fillings, they can prep and, and fill fillings, they can treatment plan. Um, and so then they, the, so then the dentist can move on to do other things at that point. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's a handful of states, uh, I'd say maybe 10 states around the country who have, um, dental therapy discussions going and each one of, each one of those states is going to have a different definition for what dental therapists are, their supervision and, um, and the type of schooling they need. So, I mean, I, um, and it's really neat when you're on the internet or part of an organization where it draws in, you know, a bigger part of the herd. I mean, there's 8 billion people in, in, in the United, in the world, and there's 2 million dentists around the world. And when you're out there going to conventions and lecturing and going to these other places, everyone you meet that, um, hired a dental therapist, they all love it. I mean, well, first of all, if they didn't love it. Why would they hire them? I mean, just right. the fact that. There, you have 89 of them hired in Minnesota. That means, you know, unless they own their own company, 89 different people made the decision that this is a good deal. And when I ask them, I say, what is the good decision? It's just like going back in time. They say, well, you know, the hygienist, they say, well, well, she's doing all the cleanings. I can just do, you know, um, other stuff, you know, place implants and root canals. Same thing with dental therapists. I mean, um, you know, my hardest day is when I walk into the dental office, my first patient is four MOD composites on two, three, four, and five. I mean, <laughs> that's just work. And then the next one is another quadrant of MO. I mean, and so you got hygienists working a couple of rooms and you got dental therapists doing all the fillings. And, and then and then the other thing is endo is just taking more time. I mean, when I got out of school, um, you know, the endodontists were trying to do molars in an hour, but now with microscopes and, and son endo and all these technologies, a lot of my endodontist friends are saying that now um, they're doing one less root canal a day because they're spending more time on the molar endo because they want to have less failures. They want to do more quality. So, so as you want to slow down and do better, higher quality implants and root canals and whatever, well, you don't want to be in there um, doing your fillings and your cleanings and all that stuff like that. And uh, so I, I still have not met uh, a dentist um, who actually has a dental therapist in their office who's told me it's a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of myths out there about dental therapists and it's, it's mostly from people who haven't employed them or haven't actually spoken with a dental therapist or spoken to uh, the employer of a dental therapist. Brett Herman, CEO and founder at Mouthwash. Mouthwatch. <laughs> what? I keep saying mouthwash. Um, <laughs> what is Mouthwatch and why does it interest you? So Mouthwatch is, is where the teledentistry comes into play. It's a teledentistry platform, um, HIPAA compliant, cloud-based, and um, it's, it's the technology behind that. And then they also sell these very um, reasonably priced intraoral cameras, um, and they're high quality ones at, at that too. So Mouthwatch is, is really, you know, kind of pulls a lot of what I do together, a lot of the mobile dentistry, you know, teledentistry will be the backbone of that. And Mouthwatch is, is one of the main players in teledentistry. And, um, you know, we're in the middle of a huge opiate crisis. I mean, when I was in um, a little kid, the Vietnam War was going on. And when we played games, we all assumed we'd have to go to, you know, serve our 12 months in Vietnam. And then you look at the total casualties of that very long, brutal war, uh, just the casualties of the American soldiers, not the casualties of the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam people, which was 10 times greater. Uh, but um, we now have that many people dying every year from opioids. And there's a Glenn Hansen, DDS, PhD, pharmacology, toxicologist at the School of Dentistry, uh, University of uh, Utah, saying that there is a complete synergism between oral health care and substance use disorder. And it seems like this. Um, it sounds like this stuff is hitting the rural areas even harder. Uh, but um, they're they're 
they're all related. And then Dr. Brittany Cadol, a mouthwatch clinical advisor, is an honoree of the Incisal Edge. But um, so so how's mouthwatch going? What, what oh, technology going. would you recommend from them? Um, well, right now they have Teledent. They're, they're, um, that's their main um, teledentistry technology. And it's a platform where you can go into, you know, go into school to whoever, whoever's the mobile provider or um, can go in into a, a location and use it on a tablet. And you can bring up a patient's chart. Um, you can use it for x-rays. You can, you know, you can assign a chart to another provider to look at and they assign it back to you. Um, and it's it's special because you can, um, it's cloud-based, but if you don't have internet access, it'll store it locally until you until you get internet access and then it'll, it'll upload to the cloud. So that, that's a lot of problems with mobile providers. The, the access, the internet access is not you know, good enough to run a cloud-based program um, on it. So, so that's a benefit to mouthwatch. And then, of course, the the intraoral camera that goes along with it. Um, it's it's just so easy to communicate. And what we're also seeing now is we're we're seeing specialists use use it to communicate with the general dentist, or you can even use it to communicate with um, you know the patient's physician. So it's it's expanding, you know, more than just the mobile aspect of dentistry. It's expanding through throughout different um, kind of webs as well. I like what uh, Brent Herman uh, is saying on his mouthwatch uh, website. He's the CEO. Um, he says the intro camera you've been waiting for at a price that finally makes sense. It's just two hundred ninety nine dollars. Now you're not going to believe this, but when I got out of school in eighty seven, they just came out with the intro camera up in Minnesota, yeah. where you were from, at Patterson. Right. And uh, oh, yeah. I went up to Patterson every year forever because my sister's in a in a nun, Catholic nunnery right up the street. Uh, so I had to go to visit Patterson for four hours and one minute to make it a tax mm -hmm. deduction to go see my sister. And <laughs> that intra oral camera, when it came out, it's called the Fuji Cam. It was okay. $38,000. And oh, now man. I'm a grandpa and they're under $300. Isn't that just amazing? Yeah. And it's autofocus. I mean, it's easy versus I see some of these old school ones where you have knobs that you need to turn and cords that, that get in the way and all kinds of things. So 30, you said 38,000? 38, $38,000. And here's what, here's what's even sillier about this story. So everyone who jumped in on this $38,000 intro camera, which was the size of a mini fridge, right. and you had to put it on a cart because you and your assistant couldn't lift it up. So here you have this mini fridge on a cart paying 38 grand. And about five years later, they were down to about 12 from other companies, but no one who bought it 38 wish they would have waited three years to buy it 12 because when you stuck that camera in the mouth and that human could see that holes in my tooth they they stood at attention and they 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 wanted to get involved and start you know brushing flossing and getting their cavities fixed and i um actually was so insane um i actually uh, bought two of the thirty eight thousand dollar ones i bought one and then i bought one a year later just because it was so heavy to move and then yeah. they went down to then it was welch allen which was from new york and they started making them for 12 and it just blows my mind uh, that now you can get that um, camera for uh, 300 bucks. Um, right. And the thing is, the more you move the cameras, the more you're at risk of breaking them, right? Plugging them in, plugging them in, and moving them around. And so, you know, Brent, he, he usually says, get one for every op. Right. That's the way you're going to make them last. Mm -hmm. And I don't call them ops because... Um, they don't understand operational logistics. I, I just call them Southwest Airlines planes. Southwest Airlines <laughs> only buys one plane, a Boeing 737. And oh, yeah. so everybody knows how to fly it. Everybody knows how to fix it. But when you go to like American Airlines and you call in sick and you say, um, oh, my guy, I can't work today. I'm sick. And I say, OK, Melissa, I'm going to call Howard. And I call Howard. I go, no, Melissa's just flying a 747. I'm certified on Airbus. And then you call your best friend. Oh, he can only fly a 727. Oh, he can. So logistically, it's insane. So when imagine getting on Southwest Airlines and the pilot comes on the phone and says, um, people uh, see that plane parked next to us at the next gate. That's that's actually my plane. And I don't know who put me on this plane, but uh, uh, my plane has, uh, you know, I'm in, the, you know, it's just insane. So we're all going to have to get off the plane and get our luggage and move over because mm -hmm. 
it's a different plane. And then I go into dentistry. The hygienist is in there for an hour. They do all this stuff. The kid needs one cavity. And you're like, well, let's just do it. Let's do it right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we'd have to um, leave, set up a room. We'd have to move your, well, wh why is that? Oh, because we built an entire operatory, but we just left out three or four little things. So now we've added 20, 30, 40 minutes of, of logistics and overhead and all that kind of stuff. So it's 747. Every operatory is the same. There, it Sorry. reduces all. And then one of my friends uh, um, here in Prescott, um, Mark Costas, you go into any one of his dozens of dental offices and you go in there, turn to the right and pull open the third drawer. Every yeah. drawer would have the same thing. That's right. And, That's right. and what I used to do back when I was um, um, had uh, personality disorders is um, I would get so upset when my assistant would leave the room in the middle of root canal or something to go get something that I'd get one of those air horns and I'd tell the oh, patient yeah. to cover their ears and then I'd lean <laughs> in the hall and go, ah! and, my, and I'd say, could you imagine being in the middle of a bypass and they say, I'm sorry, we got to stop and go go in the next room, get something out of the third drawer. Hell, it's a filling or a crown or a root canal. Yeah. No one's leaving the room. So I made that law that, so then I, the, the, the staff did not like the air horn. So we made a law that if you had to leave the room, you could only, you couldn't leave the room. You had to beep the office manager and she had to get it for you just to keep showing her this is unacceptable. But the dentist think I'm saving money by only buying one, and then their most expensive uh, item, uh, labor, 25 to 30%, the associate dentist, 25 to 35%, 55% of, of the cost is in the people, and you always have people standing around waiting for yeah. a tool. That's right. Or a chair. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it's just, it's just an operational logistics game. Um, so what else um, are you um, excited about Mouthwatch? Mouthwatch. Well, they just um, they just partnered with Dental Works, which is a, a portable equipment company, um, and they produced uh, the first teledentistry mobile cart. So it has a computer, it has the suction, the drill, the air water syringe. It has everything all in one. Um, so so that's fascinating. You know, like a cart that you would see in a hospital. Um, just partnered so with just, what was the name of the company? Dental Works. Dental Works. D-N-T-L Works. D-N-T-L Works. One word? Yep, one word. And, um, but, so, but continue, yeah. So so that's super exciting because then that that is just another delivery model. You know, you can buy one for the practice and then, you know, move it around to each to each room and um, have the teledentistry capability there. Huh, that is, uh, that is amazing. So, um, so again, to the graduating class that just got out of school, um, what would you do if they said, I'm interested in um, mobile dentistry, teledentistry, um, in the, you know, what, what would you, what would you tell them? So what I would say, you know, each state, each dental practice act is completely different from the next state. So I would say the first thing you need to do is to learn your state practice act backwards and forwards, be able to cite it verbatim, because if you don't know that, you don't know what your possibilities are. And you know what? It shocks me to this day. It shocks me. I swear there's colleagues of mine who dentists and assistants and hygienists who haven't read their state practice act since they were you know, in school. And then they're asking all of these questions. Well, what do I do here? What do I do there? I'm like, you, you need to know your possibilities first before you can embark on your journey. So I would say, get to know your state practice act, fall in love with it, drink a glass of wine or some whiskey while you read it, just to, <laughs> just to get through it. But do that. And then the second thing is to network, like I said, in-person network with people who are actually on the same journey. Well said. So Dental Works Equipment Corporation, they're in um, Colorado too. Um, mm -hmm. So... Um, is this a, a call? Why, why, why is more of this happening in Colorado? I mean, I mean, I know they were the first to do many things, but why, uh, why is, um, why is the first independent practicing uh, hygienist Colorado? Why is dental works in Colorado? What, what is the, uh, what, what do you think that is? The entre the dental entrepreneurship in Colorado? You know, I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that. Maybe Colorado is just cooler than everybody else. I have no idea. Huh. Um, but, um, so that's Dental Works. It's uh, D-N-T-L Works. 
uh, equipment in Centennial, California. And um, so is, is there, is Dental Works uh, portable dental equipment, is it almost entirely for mobile dentistry or are they selling a lot of dentistry in, um, um, in building dentists too? It's, it's mostly for portable dentistry, mobile dentistry, um, and they have a lot of things on the, on the back burner right now. You know, they'll sell uh, portable chairs and, and different units, just, you know, a unit for hygiene or a unit for restorative work. Um, it's, it's, it's a great resource to have for any mobile clinician, for anyone that's interested in, in embarking on that journey. All right. And um, what should I have asked you that I wasn't smart enough to ask? Um, I think you were pretty thorough. It was pretty thorough. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We could talk about love in the workplace a little bit more. Yeah. Let's talk uh, about that. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah. Let, let's, let's think outside the box. Let's start first with okay. why I hate the workforce and then move into, uh, I love in the workforce. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start with the hate part? <laughs> so, so what, what is it? It's, um, what, what is love in the workplace to bring back love as an action into dental practice everywhere. And it's out of what St. Petersburg, um, college 2011. No, that, that's just my own. That's just my own, um, hashtag campaign, um, that I, the, that for, we launched for Twitter or Facebook. Or, or or it was like, mostly Facebook. Okay. I did expand it through a couple platforms, but it was mostly Facebook. Yeah. And basically what's been happening is, you know, in a lot of these Silicon Valley, you know, startups, and wellness is, is a huge, you know, hot topic right now, just even outside of dentistry, employee wellness. They, you know, they're putting sleep pods in in different businesses and and coffee bars and, you know. Um, gyms and businesses just to keep up with employee wellness, right? Right. Um, but, but really the backbone of, of the love in the workplace campaign is just the simple fact that one day I woke up and realized, you know, it takes work to love people. And so like, <laughs> it takes love work it. to, it to takes, love your partner in your now, marriage. Now, were, were, you, were you specifically talking about my mom or my five <laughs> sisters? Well, that's what I was going to say. It takes... You, you work to love your spouse, your partner, your family, your siblings, and your kids. But what about the people that we spend the most time with 40 hours a week? You know, love has been banned from workplaces for as long as I've been a around. You know, the Me Too movement is part of that. Um, I was talking to a guy the other day about, about this love in the workplace hashtag campaign. And he says, he says, Melissa, that's just a lawsuit waiting to happen, putting love, you know, in the workplace. And I said, that's my point. We can't think about loving somebody as a friend or truly loving them in, in our jobs without some kind of skewed filter thrown on that. Um, and so really, you know, it's all about what, what my goal with this is is to get all of us talking about having empathy for each other in, in the workplace, active listening for bosses to, for employers to really, you know, go out of the way to love their employees, for managers to really listen to their employer, but also to those they manage. And it's something that we just, we're not allowed to do right now. Um, so it's interesting. People usually cringe when they think about like, oh, loving my boss or loving the people that I work with. But it, it really will fix a lot of what's going on in dentistry right now, but also on a broader spectrum as well. So then I'll take the opposite. Um, you're going with, uh, um, <laughs> you're going with the hashtag love in the workplace. And what all what I'd say is to have love in the workplace, the, the, be the best managers get rid of the DNF toxic people the fastest. <laughs> And there's right. nothing, there's nothing more demoralizing to one of your team members who think that you like them and respect them. And I've always said for 30 years that, you know, I got five sisters and, um, my gosh, um, when someone, when a woman has worked for me for five years, she, she turns into your sister. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, and there's a lot of love and respect there. And then she's looking at you like, you're going to, you're going to just allow that to happen. I mean, why, why does she get to just turn into a uh, psycho lady and um, so, so the best managers are the ones that, um, you know, the, when, the, when they realize that Sam is toxic and insane, they get rid of him. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and so for love in the workplace for me, it's, um, it's 
Hire slow, fire fast. When you know Marion is batshit crazy and toxic and moody, it, you're, you're not going to have love in the workplace when you keep looking the other way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, a lot of dental offices don't even get to that point. They don't even get to a cohesive team. And that's why all these consultants and co consulting companies are so popular right now, because these dental offices, these teams can't even get to the place where they realize it's a dysfunctional environment. So, so you're um, very successful in all these different areas. Um, where does that come from with you? Just my drive. I've always kind of been the black sheep. I've always kind of asked why, why is this the case and how can I make it better? Um, and so that's just who I am. You know, I come from a pretty conservative uh, upbringing, a pretty conservative area. In Minnesota? And, uh, no, in Pennsylvania, actually. Are you Amish or Mennonite? Are you yeah. really Amish? Or is that right? Unbelievable. My grandparents were Amish. Yep. And then we were Mennonite. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know why the Amish and the Mennonite, they're they're both really so most a lot of the early immigration in the United States was Protestants protesting the Catholic faith. Right. And they were coming here and the lot almost half of them were from Germany, like the Amish and the Mennonite. Do you do you remember from your Bible studies why the Amish and the Mennonites split up? Um you know what? No, I should. <laughs> so they were they were against technology. So they didn't mm -hmm. like technology. And then a new technology came out and and half of them said, we're going to adopt this technology. And the other half said, we're absolutely not. It's the devil's work. And they split up over this new technology. And guess what the technology was? Was it the bike? Buttons. Buttons. <laughs> it was buttons. And now when I'm in Kansas, which has the largest, are they in Kansas? Are they uh, Mennonites or Amish? I think they're both in Kansas. Yeah, and anyway, it's, it's the largest um, population of their group is in Kansas, and it's just so adorable to be driving behind a horse and buggy with horse and, and the little girl in the back, and she's got the clothes on and the hat and everything, and she's on her iPhone. Right. And I'm right. like, okay, something's not right with this picture. Mm -hmm. Your little girl's on an iPhone back there, but anyway, uh, so so you so it was the conservative family. And mm -hmm. you were ambitious and you question everything. Yeah, Would you say I question that's... everything. And I, you know, I'm one of the only ones to have a four-year degree and, and move away from, you know, even consider moving away from, from my, where I was raised. And so I've just been always, you know, why, why is this the case? And always asking questions. And, you know, thankfully my parents and, and my family have given me the freedom to, to do that as well. That, that's a huge thing to, to be a little different than they are. <laughs> and so, and some kids, um, when, when they have all that, some do it with just why, why, why with a smile on their face and just cure naturally curious, but then some do it with, um, you know, upset and mad and frustrated at the world. And I can tell by all that you're doing, the volunteer, the non-volunteer, the all that kind of stuff, I, that you were born and you question all these things, but you did it out of a good heart and curiosity uh, it didn't make you mad at the world. No. <laughs> or did it? Or everyone has some anger. No, it does. Part of me is mad because, you know, as I, as I think about dentistry and the dental profession and, you know, even, even on the broader spectrum, there's a lot of, um, women in the workplace issues. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, dentistry isn't very friendly to parents or mothers. You know, there's a lot of things like this that that we need to really work on and and help change. We need to support mothers who are pregnant and have longer maternity leaves, and um, you know, just just things like that. So there is some anger there. Honestly, there is some anger that's that's a driving force too, um, and I think that helps keep keep me going sometimes. I uh, I have a woman president of my company for 20 years, and you look at my seven department managers. Uh, it's five women and two boys, but I was very sensitive because I had five sisters and all that sexism and all that stuff wasn't from government and workplace. It was my own family. I could go swim in the Arkansas river, which was a block from my house, any yeah. guy, any, but my sisters could not get within 10 foot of the edge. And then I'm a boy wanting my sisters to swim with me, but they can't swim because they're a girl and I'm, but anyway, I saw this just insanity just in my own house. And I realized, okay, this, this is something seriously wrong with that. But there, let me tell you one, one secret, um, on the, on any of these inequalities, um, it, it just means nothing but opportunity. So when all the fortune 500 companies, 
uh, all want to have male CEOs and department heads and all that stuff like that. That means in half the humans are women. That means there's just a ton of talented women that aren't employed. So if you have the foresight to realize that, oh my God, I mean, you can hire a higher quality woman um, because she won't get picked up by the S&P 500 yeah. all day long. And I know so many dental manufacturers that realize that. And especially right. ones in California, they say, you know, nobody out here is going to hire someone if they weren't born in the United States of America. So they don't even run their ads in English because they, it's going to be a bunch of the English okay. reading women are going to look at it and say, well, they'll never hire me because I'm a girl. And then the the ones that are girls are guys in different language saying, well, why would they run an ad in Vietnamese or Korean or Filipino if they didn't want to interview me? And that and that is their secret sauce to get the yeah. most competitive employees. I heard the same thing uh, from a dentist in Boston. And he said, really? my God, he said, I, I once I realize this town is they ought to call it just little Brazil. Uh, there's so many Portuguese people there. And once he started running all of his ads for all dental people in uh, in just Portuguese, he had hygienists driving an hour across town to get a job there. And the next thing you know, his practice doubled in size just with the, the um, Portuguese community. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and in Portuguese, 19 out of 20 Portuguese-speaking people are from Brazil, not Portugal. So, so yeah, so it, when you see those types of injustice, that means that means there's big opportunity somewhere. But we went way over, and uh, um, you got better things to do. You got two kids at uh, home. How are the two kids doing? Oh, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Is that two of two or two of four or two of what? How many are you going to have? Uh, two of two. Two yes. of two? <laughs> two of one. <laughs> uh, two of one. All right. Well, hey, um, thanks for all that you do. And uh, thanks for, uh, I just love your energy. I just love your, uh, your think outside the box. I love your flair for marketing. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was an honor to podcast interview you. Thank you, Howard.